Okay. Well, it looks like it's 10 o'clock, so we'll get started. So good morning, everybody. Um, welcome. My name is Mary Collier. I'm the professional, professional Development Program Manager at the Ontario Museum Association, and I'm very happy to welcome you to Ask Me Anything with Sarah Bean Borg, which is a co-presentation with the Group of Ontario Emerging Museum Professionals Committee. Um, so before I start, I'd like to respectfully acknowledge that Toronto, where the OMA offices is located, has been the site of human activity for over 15,000 years. This land is the territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit, Haudenosaunee, and Huron-Wendat. And Toronto is home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work um, in the community on this territory. So thank you for being here this morning. Um, I hope uh, everybody is well and ready for a really great conversation. Um, I just want to start by making sure that everybody knows how to participate today. So you will see, you should be able to see my slides on the screen right now and see um, the presenters' faces and hear us speak. Um, if you would like to send a message to uh, a question to the presenters, simply type your message into the Q&A box that you can um, access either at the top or bottom of your screen. Um, if you'd just like to say hello to your colleagues, um, you can uh, use the chat function, which is also at the bottom of your screen. And um, so I will be here in the background. My colleague Christopher Shackleton is signed in as the Ontario Museum Association. So if you're having any technical issues, um, you can uh, send a chat message to one of us. So we will be monitoring the Q&A throughout the webinar and um, Madeline will try and get to as many questions as possible in the time that we have. Um, so this webinar is being recorded and the recording will be made available probably later today. So the webinar is going to be one hour. I should go to my next slide. There we go. Um, we'll be one hour. We'll begin with a bit of an introduction and then I'll pass it over to our presenters um, to have their conversation. And then at the end, I'll do a few quick announcements and we'll wrap up at around 11 a.m. So I would like to introduce our moderator today. It's Madeline Smallers. Um, Madeline is a chair of the group of the um, Ontario Emerging Museum Professionals Committee. She's a museum professional with a strong interest in the experiences of diverse populations in cultural spaces, particularly through the accessible and inclusive management of programs, human resources, communications, and operations. And our speaker today um, is Sarah Bean Borg. Sarah is the Director of Business and Project Development at the award-winning museum services and design firm Origin Studios, um, but her professional experience in museums has included roles as collections manager, assistant curator, project manager, and senior exhibitions manager. So um, I think it's going to be a wonderful conversation today, and I'm going to pass it over to Madeline and Sarah to get started. Beautiful, thank you so much, Mary. Um, as Mary stated, my name is Madeline Smolars, my pronouns are she and her, and I'm calling in from Kingston, uh, which is sitting on land that is traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe people. So I'd like to recognize that in that, this space. Um, thank you very much to the OMA for having us here today. The Group of Ontario Emerging Museum Professionals Committee has been around for a number of years and I'm chair from 2019 to 2022. Uh, of late, we've been working on several initiatives. One was a COVID-19 survey that we sent out to the EMP community in Ontario, essentially asking what they're experiencing during COVID-19, uh, what they need and how we can help. And two of the biggest things that came out of that survey, um, first of all, was advocacy, um, essentially having us approach uh, organizations such as the OMA and uh, established museum professionals to advocate for EMP needs, um, but also to provide professional development. And that is where this webinar today comes in. And thank you very much to Sarah Bean Borg. She had reached out to us, goodness, over a month ago, kind of just offering a hand saying, hey, I'm here and happy to help and I took her up on that. So thank you very much for being a good sport, Sarah, and joining us here today. Very much appreciate that. Um, I'm going to try and share my screen just to make it available or make some links available to everybody. Um, I'm going to, um, let's see here, my entire screen. This has worked in the past, so hold on with me here. Um, let's see, an application window. Oh, beautiful. Okay, so I am now sharing my screen. And if no one can, if someone can't see this, please let me know. 
Um, but I just wanted to make some links available to you all in terms of the Group of Ontario Emerging Museum Professionals Committee. Um, of course, we have our website there. Um, we also have an email and you can reach out to us anytime. It's really well monitored. It's the chief email that I use for um, GoEMP communications. If you search for our full name on Facebook, you will find us very easily. We have a really strong community of over 1300 people on there um, from Ontario and, and other places as well. It's really beautiful the way it's kind of become a little uh, Canada wide and international space as well. And then of course we use the hashtag GoEMP on Twitter. And I did throw of course my name up there and that is also my Twitter handle as well. So if you wanted to reach out to me later on or tweet at me during this presentation, I can't promise I can respond during this presentation, uh, but I will certainly get back to you and would be happy to chat further about this. Um, so that is kind of everything there. Hopefully you can find us pretty easily. And I will stop sharing my screen now. And hopefully that has worked. Perfect. I'll start my video again, hopefully. There we go. That was pretty seamless. Um, so today I would now like to introduce our speaker, uh, our Ask Me Anything person, the me being uh, Sarah Bean Borg. Uh, she's joining us, I believe, also from Toronto. Correct me if I'm wrong, Sarah, but I would like to turn the mic over to you to introduce yourself before we get rolling today. Perfect. Uh, thanks, guys. Um, this is pretty cool that this has come together the way it has. Um, I was, I, during COVID, had a career change. And so with that, I have been spending a fair amount of time online because with my new position I have time to think and I have time to research and I found Go EMP and I was so immediately drawn to the mission and the intention of the organization and and on it just sort of like I just I wanted to be available to you guys I wanted to make myself present and supportive and give you guys a voice or to give you guys advice um, when I started out in the field back in 1997, which feels like 100,000 years ago now, um, there wasn't anything like Go EMP. There was no real support for emerging museum professionals. And it's a tough little field we're in. It's a beautiful field. It's a passionate field. It's an interesting field. Um, but it is hard sometimes to get your fingernails into the crack and pull yourself into uh, active roles in the field. And so I reached out and just, and as Madeline says, that email address is very well monitored because she replied really quickly, which was great. And I just wanted to make myself available. So the momentum of this has been really impressive. Thank you, Madeline, for charging forward. And Mary, as always, it's awesome to be associated with the OMA and, and the amazing programming that you guys are doing. And as we go through today, I just, I really want everybody who is actively participating today and or people who watch this later in the video as it's shared with your constituents to know that there are lots of really generous museum professionals in the field. Um, I'm certainly not the only one. I'm probably just, I have a big loud voice. And so I just really keep, keep at it, keep talking to me. Um, I forgot to put it in my slides, but I'll give out my email address for sure so that people can get in touch with me directly. Um, and I just, I'm really happy to be here today and, and, and just ask me anything today, but also ask me anything for the whole rest of my time in the field. If I can help, I will. Um, and if I can inspire my other mid-level career or senior career uh, colleagues to do the same, I absolutely will. So this is a torch I will carry for a long time. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, yes, yeah, Sarah has been a really willing participant and representative of, as she said, the support that is out there in the community for EMPs. Um, it can be a little tricky to find and I shared that in the blog post that I had written, you know, um, it's already difficult to make those connections in person, but COVID has just like blown that up on a huge scale and made it even more difficult. So um, kudos to Sarah for stepping forward and for sharing her experience. Um, and I know she has assembled a, a couple of slides to, to talk about that experience. And uh, so you all know her a little bit better before we dive into the awesome questions that you sent via the OMA and our Google form. Okay. 
Perfect. So then I will take that torch back uh, and, and I will go into my screen. I have to apologize right now. As I was doing this PowerPoint and it was quick, it was rough and dirty. There's a lot of pictures of me in it. And I feel weird about that. I'm having like an attack of the humbles right now because suddenly I'm bringing myself forward. And in my field, I've always worked in exhibition development and exhibition management. And it's always been my desire and my preference to be the pedestal on which giants stand. Like I am want to be moving curators and artists forward for the best interest of the visitor. And so it is weird for me to be putting out pictures of myself because I'm much more comfortable with uh, letting the art and the artists do the talking. So without further ado, I will do that now. But again, apologies that there's a lot of my face in this. Um, and the, one of the first slides um, is, uh, <laughs> Is, uh, it's embarrassing. Yesterday when Madeline and I were talking and, and with Mary, we talked about, you know, actually having <laughs> uh, a picture of myself from when I was a student. So I did that. Okay, so um, I, as I said, I have been in the field since 1997. Um, I did an undergraduate degree in cultural anthropology at the University of Waterloo. And then I went immediately into the museum uh, management and curatorship program at Fleming College. So that is the dorkiest picture of me imaginable in the upper left corner of the screen. Um, cleaning artifacts and learning preventive conservation. I chose the Fleming program really strategically. At the time, the U of T program was very theoretical. There was very little hands-on, there was very little um, applicable skill set development because it really was a very academic program. And so as a, an objects person, I really, really wanted to get in quickly and, and get the skills I needed. So in the center of the screen, you'll also notice through this, I have had every hair color under the sun. Um, in the center of the screen, this is a picture of me just after my internship. So my internship for the program was at the Battishu Museum and that was in 1997 and then they hired me which was really incredible at the time um, and that is me sitting with a new acquisition. Those are four pairs of shoes that were worn by Ginger Spice. <laughs> at the time the Spice Girls were a pretty big deal and um, Mrs. Bata was completely against the acquisition at the time but realized that speaking to contemporary visitation uh, was essential and hilariously enough it was the only time that we could get uh, the mayor um, whose name I just forgot damn it I'll remember it later it was the only time we could get him in the building because he didn't see the value of the shoe museum and so um, Mel Lastman. Mel Lastman was the mayor at the time. Uh, and it was the, it was the thought of proximity to Ginger Spice or her footwear that brought the mayor in to value this incredible cultural institution. Um, I threw the photo in on the right because um, when I recently had my press photos done as I was thinking of making a career shift, um, one of the things, well, this is an outtake because I was laughing with a photographer is a friend of mine and she made me laugh really hard. And I have, it's weird to like a photo of yourself, but I like this photo and I wanted to use it as my press photo because can you imagine how incredible the world would be if you could use as your professional photo, a photo of joy. And so this is a photo that for me, if I could, if I didn't still have a mortgage and could handle the constant rejection of using this as a photo in an application process, um, I, I, would, I would use it. But um, the professional photo that Mary and, and uh, Madeline very politely used for the call out for today is, is, is a more professional photo. And so talking about oneself and one's journey, I really just wanted you guys to know that joy should be and probably is a defining factor in your professional decision making if you are in this field. And so be joyful. Um, you can go from dorky to dorky in 20 short years. I have photographic evidence right here. Okay. Um, I'm going to go through a couple slides. A lot of these are from the Aga Khan Museum. So I had the incredible fortune of um, ending up as exhibitions manager and senior exhibitions manager at the Aga Khan Museum. Um, I started prior to the museum opening, so I was part of the team that opened it. Um, and, I, and I left uh, this uh, March after an incredible time. And I left because it was time for me 
both to move on, but also to get out of the way so that the women and men behind me who would have the opportunity to walk into that position had a position to walk into. And so it's, it's a lot of these photos are from there. It was an incredible seven years, the most important years of my professional life. Uh, no, no, no disrespect to the Badashu Museum, but what we did at the AKM was the undoable. Um, often, and, and this is a little something to think about, when you're applying for a job and you're looking at the job uh, description or you're looking at the posting, don't ever underestimate that you can do almost anything. The job description doesn't actually reflect what your job will be. If I were to write down all of the things that we did against many, many odds um, to get the AKM open, I would never have applied for that job. I would have thought, well, I can't do those things. I don't know how to do those things. And so just keep applying, even if it looks like something you don't understand. Um, if you feel that you are, are, are relevant and suitable, please put your, put your face forward um, and put your, your application in. Um, the more often organizations see your name, uh, the more apt they are to be aware of your desire and your interest in the institution. Um, and so these, these photos here are just, the thing I wanna say is, don't ever think that you can't do something. So uh, my laptop, my tape measure, I'm not a mathematician, but I'm an exhibitions manager. And my whole job is to under, uh, understand dimension, proportion. Um, don't worry about counting on your fingers. Like if you have to use your fingers to count to 10, use your fingers, they're right there for you. The tools are there for you. Um, get every single certification you can as far as um, uh, workplace safety goes or working at heights. So, you know, the photo in the, in the sort of center left, um, I, I put that in there because we were, we are, or the AKM is, sorry, I'm so recent that I've left, um, is really committed to art in non-traditional spaces. So there is a real embrace of putting art in public spaces in the museum. And so this is an installation we did for contact which required that our entire team spend two days up in the air on a, on a 32 foot uh, genie lift. So if you're at an organization for an internship, ask to be part of the trained team. So in your, if, if people are bringing in a service provider to do training for staff, ask if you can, ask if you can take that training. Like working at heights is an incredible um, advantage. And so uh, that's kind of why I have that slide in there. Um, the sort of center top right slide, uh, photo is not a project I was involved in, but I was lucky enough to have a really, really lovely relationship with the manager of the um, uh, ICT, the uh, Islamic Center Toronto, or Ismaili Center Toronto. And so they had a broken piece of glass on their roof. And he said, come on, do you want to see how this sort of thing gets fixed? And so never say no, never say no to an opportunity. Like if someone says to you, come on, let's go watch paint dry, go watch paint dry because they're asking you to do something because that skill set will come in handy. And weirdly, paint dries a totally different color than it goes on, as we all know. But if you're working in a museum uh, space and your painters are there, if you're not there watching the paint dry and confirming that the color is the color you want and need, who's responsible? Go watch paint dry, go watch glass panels be installed. It was also super fascinating. So I really appreciated the opportunity to see that. But I had a couple of colleagues who were like, why are you going to do that? Like this has nothing to do with your job. It's like, I am watching one of the most complex installations of a glass panel I will ever have the opportunity to watch. And so as an installer at heart, for me, that was fascinating. So even if it doesn't sound interesting, go for it. If you're not busy, go and watch paint dry, go and watch glass be installed. The bottom right hand corner is a funny photo and the woman with the blonde hair always hates when I use this photo. She's a, a tremendous friend and colleague. Her name's Sarah Chait. Um, it looks like she's just standing there. She's not. That case is so hard to open and close that her position is strategic. So Curtis and I are on the floor trying to lock the case while she pushes the exact half millimeter needed for things to line up. Um, as a manager of people and as someone who has been managed, um, 
the value of trust and honesty and commitment in your team is essential. And so my heart broke to leave this team at the AKM, but they will rise by, by removing myself from that layer, they will pop into those spaces and there's more room for their beautiful voices to be heard. And so my trust in that team was incredible. And it's just um, never ever also, as you move up in your career, miss the chance to get on the floor and unlock a case with your team wash the plexi, sweep the floor, do those things that even though they don't look like the top level of what you should be doing, no matter where you are in your career trajectory, those are the things that show your team you're in it with them until 3 a.m. if it's necessary. Um, these slides, again, it's a continuation of exactly what I was just saying. Um, think about putting art in non-traditional spaces. Um, we, the upper left-hand photo, uh, I, I'm trusting that your screen looks exactly like mine, but there's a photo, uh, a, a big photographic installation in one of the reflecting pools in front of the museum. Um, we were working again with uh, Contact uh, Photography Festival, and um, we decided that we would put art in the pools because the director of, of the AKM, Henry Kim, is an incredible supporter of crazy ideas. And so if it's crazy enough and you can make it work, it's always worth trying. And so people, people said, oh no, this will never work, this will never work. And it was, I think, one of the most impactful installations the museum has ever had um, because it was unexpected and it was really affordable. Uh, we built the structures and that's, it's a reproduction, obviously, of, of a photograph and it's outdoor vinyl. But for the cost of basically, um, I think that whole project was under $25,000, we could install 10 monolith uh, installation um, uh, photographs on, as an installation in the garden. Um, bottom left hand corner, uh, uh, again, two very close friends of mine, uh, Simon Barron, a very talented and really, really interesting person to know. Also for Go EMP, he's the installation project manager at AKM. And he literally can do anything. When they said to us, hang the moon, we all kind of joked because every curator wants you to hang the moon as a, as a sort of a colloquialism. And we actually did. This is an artwork by a British artist named Luke Jerram. And we did an exhibition uh, about the moon and the moon in Islamic art. And so uh, literally hanging the moon is something that when we first started talking about, I was like, oh my gosh, how are we going to do this? And Simon was always the perfect person while I was standing there panicking about how the heck we were going to do this. He just walked away and did it. And so, again, working with people who are tremendously talented, willing to do anything, work at heights, install art that's important and, and impactful, um, that's been a huge part of, of my career and, and the enjoyment of my career. Um, I realize I should actually kick back a little bit and give a bit more information about myself, but um, I'll do that after and fill in some of my education background. Uh, always put art first always put the visitor second. The visitor is essential, essential. It's a very close second. It's like a razor thin line between the importance of those two things. But the safety of the art and the beautiful installation of art and objects in museums is your first focus. And your second focus is unpeeling all of the meaning that you can for the visitor. Uh, also have fun. Have a great amount of fun every single day. You know, that old adage, it, it, do something you love and you never work a day in your life. Um, I've been working now for 23 years in the field and I haven't worked a day in my life. I've worked harder than I ever could have imagined, but it never really feels like work. Um, and play and have fun and hoot around and prioritize your team. Um, you know, they always say, you know, don't, don't bring in food because then you'll look like, you know, the, just the mom of the team. Feed people and make them laugh. Mm. And they'll do almost anything. Um, even though Timbits are pretty gross, they're a pretty good uh, incentivizer. Um, 
again, uh, pictures of people at work. Um, uh, Megan uh, in the orange photo in the foreground of the, of the photo is the registrar at the Aga Khan Museum. Uh, a tremendous, tremendous resource. I think I can also suck her into being uh, part of the GoEMP uh, support network. Uh, on the right hand side is a photo of an artist we worked with named Echo Nimako. He's Toronto based, he's a Lego artist and is one of the most generous and talented people I've ever worked with. On the left-hand side, it's the back of his head, which is unfortunate, is another incredible artist, um, uh, Kavork Murad. Uh, these are two of the individuals that the Aga Khan Museum has had the most um, incredible time working with. Working with living artists is difficult. Uh, for those of you who've already done it, you know what I mean. Uh, for those of you who will in, in your future, um, I wish you much luck and much patience. There is so much beautiful creativity um, that artists produce. And if you make the, if you make the resources available and the, and the, and the goodwill and the support, um, our creative um, output is unstoppable and it's really powerful and working with these two artists uh, reminded me that museums are really and galleries are really here to expand people's minds to start conversations to become a forum for easy and difficult conversations and both of these artists are making huge statements with their art um, and they are generous and the generosity of their time uh, with us was incredible and so in your in your field and in your career also lean into the opportunity to work with living artists because you will learn so much both about their practice but about the creative process okay this one's a funny one. Um, your phone it, throughout your lifetime or your camera or your or your laptop will be full of stupid photos like these photos of don't touch the artwork. Great ways to say it. Um, bottom left hand corner is just a really cool mount for a coin. This is my poor exhausted family as I drag them to see the Mona Lisa, which was the least interesting thing I have ever visited in my life, no matter how impactful that painting is the Louvre in their attempt to protect it, which is honorable. It has become the most sterile and uncomfortable experience with art I've ever had. And it reminded me that there are more creative ways to give people access to the world's masterpieces than what is done at the Louvre. Um, in the upper right hand corner, uh, that's just a photo of a panel that needs to be replaced. And every single time you walk through your own galleries or walk through your own spaces, thinking about um, how fresh things are and, and, and when they need to be replaced is really important. So always save budget for replacement panels. We should all be so lucky that our, our museums are visited this much that this panel could get that scratched. I think that's the Viking show from the ROM. And so for a short run show, they had that many motivated visitors who leaned against that panel or touched that panel or abraded that panel. And so we want people in our galleries, but we also want them to feel even on the last day of the show that it's as fresh for them as it as it is uh, for for you on the first day. And so um, uh, yeah, it was just for me a reminder not to leave exhibitions to go tawdry like keep them fresh, keep them important. Uh, the bottom right hand corner, and this is, seems in, entirely ungenerous of me. I love taking photos of bad installations at other museums. This is, um, this is the Gulbenkian Museum um, and it's, it's in Portugal and it's uh, in Lisbon and it's a beautiful collection, but these are some of the most beautiful carpets I've ever seen in my life on the lowest, smallest risers and people were stepping on them and tripping on them. And so these photos that I, my phone, literally at least 4,000 of the 6,000 photos in my phone are of bad installations or good installations. So beg, borrow and steal from every museum you visit and visit every museum you can. Not, you don't have to pay to get into every museum. Like think about the importance of footfall. If you can't afford to go find out the free day and go on the free day. Um, you'll learn lots just by spending time with you know, the things your colleagues have done. 
these last two slides I'm going to look at really fast. Get really, really good at public speaking. Not everybody's comfortable with it. I'm lucky. I'm very comfortable with it. But in my career, I have done so much live TV, morning TV, lecture style uh, presentations, webinars, conferences. If you don't bring your voice to the table, no one's listening. I know public speaking is hard for some people and I get it. It's easy for me to say, do it, but take Toastmasters, do whatever you can, talk to your cats, give speeches at your dinner table, do what you need to do to get conversant because we've all been at those lectures where someone has spoken from notes and all you see is the top of their head the entire time and you can feel their pain and you can feel their anxiety and they may be a leader in the field but you haven't been able to connect with them. And so getting really good at that um, is gonna help you a lot in your career. And now we have seen enough of my dumb face and I'm gonna stop sharing now. Are we back to normal now, Madeline? Is it like what's on? Yes, I can normal? see just you and it shared beautifully. So thank you very much. You very and well. I can't believe you took up my challenge of sharing a photo of early <laughs> career, Sarah, that was, so lovely and we all have those photos right and it's important to harken back to that time and to to remember that time as one of great learning and um one of fond memories as well so thank you for being a good sport about that i really appreciate it and they were they were awesome really thank awesome thank you um so we had some Excellent questions uh, submitted to you ahead of time. Um, mm -hmm. Some that were kind of bigger picture ideas and some that were kind of honing in a little bit more on your experience specifically as a museum professional. Um, so because you've been speaking about your work uh, with exhibitions and whatnot, I thought we would start off with one question that had to, that essentially has to do with that, that aligns with that. Um, so if you don't mind, uh, what would you say to this person who is asking, how do you get to the heart of an exhibit or interpretive plans, big idea? And they have that in quotes. Yeah, it's an excellent question. Um, there's two ways. Uh, when a curator is researching and thinking and formulating, they will get really deep in it. Like they're literally the nucleus of this really, really dynamic brain process. But it also means they completely lose co contact with what the show should be saying or doing. And so I will always spend time, I will ask a curator to talk, just talk. And then two days later, I will say, tell me again, tell me everything again, let's start from the beginning. And you will hear at least two or three things that will come out in both conversations. It's because it's their reptilian brain hard at work, but those two or three things, they're there and they're inescapable. So you tease those out and the curators will often say, no, 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 those aren't important, those aren't important, but it's, they, they know they are, they're, it's floating around. And then taking those two things and thinking, how do I, as a lay person, I'm a total lay person, right? Like for every exhibition I do, if we're gonna do an exhibition on the moon in Islamic art or an exhibition on paper clips, I am your visitor as the exhibitions manager, I'm your visitor advocate. If those two or three things can't be defined, you don't have a show, you have an essay or you have a publication. And it's a very expensive way to do an exhibition if you cannot distill those expected learning outcomes or generic learning outcomes, different institutions use different things. So you go back to the curator and you say, I have read your skeletal outline. I understand how you wanna sequence this. We have to in every zone or every section or however they want it described or every room if you've got a, a historic house, we have to circle back to these two things. Um, and never more than three, never more than three ideas. The big idea often comes from whatever internal working title you guys are using. So we 
at AKM, we often, and actually at the Battersea Museum too, we often would condense an exhibition to a one word title. So, um, I'm blanking on an example, but uh, like the moon, the moon, we had a million titles like the mirror of time and blah, blah, blah. Like we had these crazy titles that were really beautiful if you were writing a poem. But if you want people to understand what you're coming to see, you're they're coming to see the moon. So let's just call it the moon. Um, distill it down because we can all get all get up our own noses about how intellectual we, we are or how smart we are or how deeply ingrained we are in the content. But if it leaves the visitor cold or if it doesn't invite the visitor in and they haven't learned anything, um, you've really done everybody a disservice. So those big ideas, I, then there's usually kind of more than one big idea, but again, never more than three. Um, get them early, repeat them, begin every single meeting where you're talking to your colleagues in the field um, and, and make sure they're resonating with people. If it's leaving people cold or they're sort of like, well, that sounds really boring. It's like, okay, well then let's use different language, but you're still explaining the same thing. I hope that helped. Yes, absolutely. I think that's, people kind of get that worry of the blank page syndrome right at the start, you know, how, how do we distill this down or how do we take our big idea and, and blow it up in a way that's going to resonate with people and um, connect them to that big idea without getting too far away from it. So I think that that makes a lot of sense and to, to make sure that you can distill it in a way that's accessible for everybody. Yeah. And also let it be messy for a while. Sorry, to yes. circle back to that. Let it be messy for a while. Um, if you think about moving, your house doesn't look ready until it's, you know, you've, you've gotten things sorted out. An exhibition doesn't need to be perfect until you begin the really deep planning stages in the research and creative phases. Let it be bonkers. Let it literally run out at the edges. Like, just let curators run and then pull them back in and just say, okay, what have you found? What's new? How do we do this? And don't hammer it down until you have to. Absolutely. So there was another question related to ex exhibits, but kind of overlapping with another theme that I pulled out from the questions that came forward, which is of course, COVID-19. It's at the yeah. forefront of a lot of our thinking. And this person asked, what do you think exhibits will look like in a post COVID-19 world, especially in terms of interactivity? Another person asked, how are museums moving forward post COVID-19? And I think these two questions kind of um, pair well together. So essentially, how can we move forward, especially with exhibitions in mind and interactivity in particular. What do you think museums are going to look like? And I'm sure you've already been thinking this have, question over yourself. Yeah, uh, very excited to see this question. Um, at Origin Studios, we're working with all of our clients right now on exactly this. So I, I have two answers and I'm going to invert the questions. So the second question for me is the immediate. And we have to look at this in short term and then long term. So in the short term, visitor safety is essential because museums are amazing places. We all love them. But we know that we are, you know, we can lean into our nerd energy because we love museums. Not everybody does. Such that um, I think it was probably about two years ago, there was a McDonald's commercial, McDonald's Canada, where they talked about museums being the most boring thing they could ever imagine. And yeah, you should go to McDonald's. And I remember just thinking, huh, I am in my own little echo chamber because I think museums are incredible. And I was shocked that McDonald's, which we all know is kind of grotesque anyway, um, would go to that length to just to, to throw museums under the bus because they're the antithesis to the joy of eating a Big Mac. Um, all that to say museums don't really get a second chance after they screw up. So with COVID, I think measured decision making for now. I was at the AGO on Friday and on Thursday last week and, and, and the previous day I went to the immersive Van Gogh exhibition. Um, 
two totally different experiences, two totally different approaches to art, both responding significantly to COVID. At the Van Gogh uh, experience, um, they gave out buffs. If you didn't bring your mask, they gave out buffs with Van Gogh's face on it with a mask on it. It was funny, it was cute. It probably cost them 80 cents per person and you're paying 90 bucks for two people to go. So it was a good investment for them. They had done a beautiful job of indicating spacing in a really elegant way with circles projected onto the floor. So we did the walk-in one, not the drive-in one. It was an interesting experience. I'm not going to give it a big review here, but the very next day I went to the AGO and it was the saddest visit I've ever had to the AGO in my career. Um, staff felt stressed, signage was everywhere and it was red and it was anxiety inducing and it was constant and five people could be in this room and six people could be in this room and nobody knew how to have a good time. It like it was quiet and I wanted to say guys get a cellist into this into the Gallery Italia. There was so much room. Give a musician a chance to practice in this incredible acoustic space uplift my heart because right now the COVID measures feel so heavy and so negative when in actual fact museums and galleries are the perfect place to feel enlightened and lifted and free and 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 stimulated and energized and I, I, I have friends at the AGO we're going to talk about you know ways that as a visitor that really was kind of negative but Right now, museums need to move cautiously with, with safety in mind. Um, everybody's hands are peeling from sanitization, um, but who knew that just washing our hands could control so many of the pathogens that we're dealing with? Like, I think we've learned so much about ourselves and about public health through COVID that will benefit museums. Now, so that's short term, get rid of anything that can't be cleaned, anything that can't be sprayed down. It's not a time to be accelerating open display. Um, it's a time to be putting things in cases just so that your visitors can feel safe and the art is safe. Also get your staff back in that building and get them talking and happy and engaging and bringing forth their incredible expertise. Some of the best conversations I've ever had in museums have been with security guards who actively live with the work all day long. And engage your security team, engage your front of house team, get your managers out of their offices or their home offices as it were, get them safely into the space, welcoming people back, make it feel like a party. Like, okay, we don't need confetti cannons or something blowing off when people arrive, but stop with the red signage stop with this hand nobody needs to see this ever again we understand most museum visitors are motivated to be good citizens they want spaces to have those experiences so that's the short term the long term and this is something we're working on with our clients post covid um, and when we talk about post COVID, we actually mean post vaccine because COVID's never, there's never going to be a post COVID. We're not post influenza. We're not even post polio. And so human beings are chimpanzees. We are literally chimpanzees. We touch our faces. We touch our butts. We scratch our armpits. We touch things. You know, a museum professional, because as soon as they walk into a room with uncovered art, they put their hands behind their back and they lean forward to just consume it with their eyes. Most visitors don't do that. Almost everybody has a percentage of tactile learning in them and they want to touch, they want to reach out. Offer people opportunities to touch things safely, to touch things that are sanitized. Offer people options. In a post COVID or a post vaccine world, please museums and galleries, don't undo the work we've been doing for 30 years years to get tactile experiences in your galleries. Recognizing the importance of education, recognizing the importance of interpretive planning, recognizing the importance of participatory learning, it can't go away. We can't pack it up because you are then designing for something other than a human being. In post-COVID, people are going to kiss again and they're gonna hug again and they're gonna hold hands and 
people are going to have affairs and people are going to do these things. We're going to do all these things that everybody's holding back on right now, but it's unnatural. And so especially in museums and galleries, don't undo that work. Let's get the vaccines sorted. Let's get safe participatory back in our galleries. If you need to give out a stylus so that people can, you know, interact with touch screens, do that. But you can also say, there is hand sanitizer right here. There are glass protectors you can get for any touch screen that still allow the touch experience. And people, you can actively engage your visitors in cleaning it. You know, in, in airplanes, in the washroom, there's always that little sign that says, please use your hand towel to wipe off the basin for the next user. Hi, let's just do that. Please, after you've engaged with this, either put it here for sanitization and, and or wipe the screen. Make it a two-way conversation. Museums have been working on being this place for two-way conversation, and this is a great way to get visitors involved in their own health and the health of the community around them, but still doing cool stuff. That was long-winded, sorry. No, that's okay. <laughs> I, I did ask you two questions, and you actually kind of answered a third a little bit. Someone was wondering, you know, what can we do in terms of, um, programming and engagement during COVID. And I think you yeah. gave some great examples that would um, kind of help that person have a little bit of guidance. So thank you. And um, during- Can I sneak uh, in? Sorry, Madeline, can oh, I sneak in with two things to that question? Let's get musicians in galleries. Let's yes. get storytellers in galleries. Um, people don't need to be sitting closer than two meters to enjoy the human voice, to enjoy poetry, do and the AKM has been doing this forever is bringing really engaging moments into galleries design your galleries with spaces for performance right now if international loans are being canceled or the funding isn't there to buy that one extra case that you need to finish the show leave that space open for performance let let people use it to understand intangible art in conjunction with tangible art so okay next <laughs> <laughs> beautiful no that was good thank you so much i like that you loop back to the the music i really I admire when we can bring together different types of art in a space to enhance each other um so we did have a question come through um while you were answering those previous now three questions. I'm so sorry. Um, and it's similar to actually a couple others that we had with respect to professional development. Yeah. So um, for example, one person asked, what are your suggestions for EMPs who will be looking to diversify their skills as museums face um, uncertain futures? Um, can you share advice for professionals who have gained work experience um, to kind of break into the industry. And then as well, one person in particular asked today, I work in exhibition project management. What are some suggested professional development courses I can take to enhance my skill set? And essentially, I think all these people are looking for a little bit of guidance and maybe perhaps reference to um, what has helped you in the past, some resources and courses that have helped you that could help them build themselves up and move forward they're all great and integrated in interesting ways and it actually reminds me that i didn't really talk about my education and my background effectively i just got straight into gonky pictures so um i have my my uh, degree in cultural anthropology museum management and curatorship and so i was at the Battishu museum uh after my internship and as i was there and starting into managing exhibitions which interestingly you can't really do training in it's sort of like you learn as you go because they don't really offer an exhibition school um i went and did a teaching degree I took a leave of absence and I went and, you know, to get a teaching degree is if you have an existing degree um, is only one year. And I went because I wanted to learn how people learn. I wanted to learn about good pedagogy. I wanted to learn about scaffolding people in just outside their comfort zone because art can be uncomfortable and should be uncomfortable in a lot of ways, unless it's, it's just decor. And so, um, Having an education degree really has helped me immeasurably. And then I went and did my PMP uh, when I was on maternity leave because I was a little uh, unchallenged in my brain on that leave. And so I started doing my PMP. A lot of people ask me if the PMP is worth it. 
Um, it's a hard thing to answer. There's very little actual training from the PMI that can be distilled down to not-for-profit small projects. So all of the learning is transferable. Oh, okay, thanks, Mary. Uh, PMP, Project Management Professional. So from the Project Management Institute, which is an international institute. Um, so it's about, it's just really, really, really uh, focused on project management and the language and the skills needed to manage everything from a $20,000 budget with four people to 500 people internationally with a $1 billion budget. So the, the ladders are all the same, like the rungs on the ladder are all the same. Okay. So that's not an easy answer though because i was fortunate enough to be working and to be able to take some time off and to be able to afford that training right now i think museums are going to be cutting budgets as we know um and i think that professional development will be one of the first things to go as people um, begin to rebuild their budgets so if people are able to do their own uh, professional development that's a shame because it puts the onus on people who are recently students uh, and also we know that this field is not famously overpaid um, and so if you can afford it uh, take the time now while COVID has us sitting a little uh, uh, sort of quietly um, if you can afford to do a little bit of extra education now's the time um, project management coursework you don't have to do your pmp i just wanted to take the exam because i like to i like deep challenges i wouldn't suggest that that was necessary for me because i don't think it has changed how people perceive my skill set although people love a good credential uh, after your name um, Project management training is excellent and you can get it at any college or any university and you can do a lot of it online. So for me, that would be the biggest, the biggest asset. Um, and other small things like if, certainly for the exhibition um, colleague who asked that question specifically, um, exhibition design um, is, is interesting and, and there's, again, that's not really trained anywhere. So at Origin Studio, we have a mix of industrial designers, architects and graphic designers. I think graphic design skills are incredible. Um, one of my sweet, amazing former colleagues at, um, at the AKM, a fairly, fairly recent graduate, my friend Alessandra, she is a genius, literally the most quiet hero I've ever met. So while I'm, you know, pushing forward on the big stuff, every once in a while I would turn to her and I say, can you, can you just do this? Can you design this? Can you lay this out for me? Like 30 seconds later, she comes to me with like four or five different amazing things. So she is a perfect example. So she's working at the AKM, a fairly recent graduate, I think within the last sort of five years, she came in in a position that wasn't her desired position and she has made a job for herself because she just came in and never said no. Like she just, she, she's always willing to do interesting, amazing things, always willing to get dirty. Um, so even if you're not doing professional development that is credentialed, if you're in an institution already, go and hang out with the facilities team, understand how the HVAC works, volunteered to be at the front desk understand visitor experience do visitor evaluation take it upon yourself to go sit in the gallery and watch for hot spots watch for dead zones watch for things people walk right past and go to the curators and say nobody's looking at this awesome thing what can we do to enliven it because probably for the cost of two square feet of vinyl you can turn that dead zone into a hot spot and so um Sort of Alessandra is my best example of, of, of an emerging museum professional uh, who, who just is always willing to do anything, learn new things, and she has these amazing skills. So um, good graphic design skills are incredible to have because they didn't teach that to my generation. I hate saying that out loud, but we didn't do graphic design. So in my job, I've always hired graphic designers and every once in a while I turn to her and she can do exactly what we've hired out for. And so graphic design for sure and anything that you find compelling anything you find interesting um visitor evaluation um is a big big burgeoning field because i think post covid there's going to be a lot of interest in return on investment 
So if an exhibition was a total dud, the ability to explain why so that you never repeat the mistakes of that are, are pretty important. So I would say those two things, museum eval uh, visitor evaluation and graphic design. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. I will put in the chat um, if anyone's looking for further information on just general museum programs as well to get started. If, for instance, you're a little bit outside the field right now, we do have a listing at the bottom of the resources page on the Go EMP website. Just I think, you know, we don't rank them or anything. We just have them in alphabetical order uh, yeah. for anybody to check out if you're curious. Um, I will say during COVID, I took a um, kind of like a management course through a local college and um, that was a great way to kind of open up my eyes to different ways of doing museum work and you know the field intersects with so many other fields um, that it's it's honestly you could start anywhere and really start to build your career in a meaningful way. Yeah, that actually stimulated a memory for me. Thank you, Madeline. Um, there's a lot of free coursework online right now, like Harvard and Yale have both unleashed a ton of good free programming. Again, it doesn't lead to a credential, but mentioning it in a cover letter, like while, while I was working from home and was working four days a week instead of five on my fifth day, I took the Harvard free blah, blah. Uh, like right now I'm taking a free course from the University of Alberta on Canadian Indigenous history, which at the Batashi Museum I was working a lot in, but I, had, I haven't been working in that field or in, in that language in over seven years. And so for me, moving forward with any Indigenous project that comes my way, I want the language, I want knowledge, and I want good basics because they don't teach it in school. And so this free course, I think it's eight weeks, um, will keep me learning. And so look for free coursework too, and then reference it in your cover letter. Who cares if it doesn't go on your resume or, or highlight it? Um, Resume stuff is interesting. Um, I'm happy to review resumes if people need resume review, so. Wonderful, thank you. Um, I know we only have about four minutes left, so I think I will try and sneak in one more question before we leave it to Mary to close us out today. Um, to finish up, someone asked, this is a hard field with lots of up and ups and downs. Yep. When did you know it was the field for you? I thought that would be a nice way to finish off today. Thank you. Um, I, I think I knew from when I was little, um, but I knew I was in a really, really boring French administration program um, when in my first year of university. And as soon as I took Anthro 101, my whole brain exploded and I knew. Again, if you can find something you love, and for museum workers, obviously it's history, the human story, objects, art, all those things. Um, I knew when I was little that I loved museums. I was lucky. I was a very, very culture uh, focused family. But sitting down in Anthro 101 and understanding humans or trying to understand humans. Isn't that lofty that I just said I understand humans? I don't understand humans. I really want to, and I like it. Um, for me, it was Anthro 101. So it was in my first year of university that I was like, okay, I'm gonna turn this into a job. I love that. I think everybody kind of has that, that inclination and then that light bulb moment. Um, for myself, I, I actually started off in linguistics and psychology. I was going to be a speech pathologist in first year university. Um, I found myself in a linguistics class thinking, I understand nothing of this and I have no desire to try and further my understanding. So what am I going to do? And I was taking an ancient Greek civilization course for fun. And I started volunteering at the museum on campus and it, it was just like that huge light bulb moment. And I, you know, went behind everyone's backs, changed my program and here we are today. So um, thank you so much, Sarah, for sharing your wisdom. We will um, certainly make your email uh, address, your hotmail available. I'll quickly pop it in the chat if that is okay uh, while perfect. Mary yep. closes us out today, but I wanted to give you a massive round of applause for that. Thank you, uh, so appreciative. Um, I know I speak for not just myself, but the Go EMP committee and many of our participants and community members here today when we say thank you. Um, so Mary, let's pass it over to you to close us out today. 
Okay, well, thank you again so much. Um, I want to I wanna echo those, those thanks and um, Sarah for, for being so open and frank and <laughs> generous with your time and, and experiences and, and Madeline and, and to your, the rest of your colleagues on the Go EMP committee. Um, you're, as, as uh, Sarah said at the beginning, a really fantastic asset for everybody in, in the Ontario and Canadian museum community. And uh, we're really fortunate, the OMA, to have you as partners. So thank you for, for pulling this together as well. <laughs> um, so I am just going to uh, do a few kind of wrapping up announcements today. I want to thank everybody who signed in today for your participation as well. Um, and just a few notes about some upcoming events. Um, so on Wednesday, we have our next uh, Museums Connect on OMA member check-in, which is just an opportunity to get together in a Zoom meeting with your museum colleagues and talk about whatever happens to be on your mind. Um, so if you'd like to join that, um, you can register on our website. If you go to the calendar um, for this Wednesday, you can find the registration link there. So I hope that we'll see you at that one. And then next week, um, we are doing a webinar with the Ontario Association of Art Galleries on scenario planning. So it's a bit of a longer webinar. It's, a, it's two hours rather than one, but it's a pretty meaty, um, pretty meaty topic. And just looking at, you know, when you can't um, rely on the same assumptions about what the future is going to look at like, as perhaps you have in the past, thinking about um, what different scenarios might look like and um, how that can help you plan. So Judy Wolf and Karen Wishart from Consulting Matrix um, have a small group of sector leaders from um, four different organizations, and they're going to kind of go through the process um, and make visible their, their um, thinking about scenario planning in their organizations and their communities. So I hope you can join us for that as well. And again, the registration link is on the calendar on the OMA website. Um, and just another um, mention that uh, we have been uh, doing these webinars free of charge as a service to the community. And if you're able, um, there are ways that you can support the OMA to continue to do this work. Um, one is if you're a member, Please, uh, please renew <laughs> when we send you your renewal reminder. Um, if you're not a member, please consider becoming a member and joining this community. It's a really fantastic one, as you can see. Um, and um, if you're able to make a donation, um, one time or continuous, that is also um, really valuable. So we thank everybody for, for your support of the OMA. And even just in your participation in events like this is a really fantastic way to make our community stronger. And we appreciate everybody um, and any way that you can participate. Um, I want to give a reminder about our COVID-19 resources page, which you can find. This is the, the link from the homepage of our website. And we just update this um, as often as we have new resources available. So please do check back on a regular basis. Um, and stay in touch. There's the OMA's contact information, Go EMP's contact information. We want to hear from you and uh, we want to work with you. So um, when you leave this webinar, you'll be um, directed to a very short um, evaluation survey, but it also has a couple of questions about um, your understanding of data and digitalization, which is going to help us um, to do some work in that realm as well in the months um, going forward. And they would be very valuable <laughs> to that. Um, so thank you again, everybody who are presenters and participants and uh, have a great day. Thanks guys. Bye.